Ready, colleagues? Ready? Mike, you ready? I'd like to call to order the April 7, 2016 meeting of the Department of Toxic Substances Control Independent Review Panel. We are here at the Kern County Board of Supervisors Chambers at the Kern County Administrative Center, 1115 Truxton Avenue, first floor in Bakersfield, California. This is the second of two days of meetings uh, that the panel has had. Uh, yesterday, we had a site visit at the Kettleman Hills facility uh, uh, in Kettleman uh, City, California. This is the uh, uh, waste management, um, chem waste, hazardous waste facility. We completed that tour yesterday, completing the first day of our activities, and now we are embarking on our second day of activities. Uh, my name is Gideon Krakow. I'm an environmental lawyer from Los Angeles. I am the chair of this panel, appointed by the Senate rules to the uh, community representative seat. We'll go through introductions briefly, and then we'll go through our agenda. Dr. Campbell. Hello, I'm Arizu Campbell. I'm an associate professor at Western University of Health Sciences, and I am the member with scientific expertise, and I was appointed by the speaker of the assembly. Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, Mike Vizier from San Diego County. I was appointed by the governor as a local government expert on the panel. I uh, have 20 years experience working with the Certified Unified Program Agency, which implements a body of environmental laws, including uh, the Hazardous Waste Control Law in the County of San Diego. Good morning, my name is Deborah Barnes. I'm a Deputy Attorney General here to represent the panel in their uh, proceedings. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Rolfus? I'm Larry Rolfus, um, staff support for the, um, for the panel. Hello, I'm Eric Gareca. I'm also staff support for uh, the independent review panel. So that's our uh, independent review panel team. Uh, we are pleased to be here today. We have an agenda in front of us, colleagues, a uh, very full agenda that potentially will take up to 6 p.m. or potentially even a little bit longer depending on the public comment that we might get at the end of the day. Uh, so we're going to go through um, uh, that um, uh, entire agenda and we'll talk about the reviewing that agenda shortly. Uh, but before we do, I would like to specifically do the meeting stand. Please enter with the flag. This is the first time we are here um, in, um, in Bakersfield uh, with the panel. So there's always some kinks to work out when you're doing something for the first time. We have a relatively complex uh, uh, touch screen system here uh, that we're still getting used to and there might be some, um, some getting used to with, with uh, those technical procedures. Uh, but this is a, a, a wonderful auditorium. I want to thank our staff, Mr. Rekka in particular, for uh, really making this so far, um, uh, the site visit yesterday and today run uh, very professionally. Uh, and we very much appreciate that and appreciate the ability to be here in this, um, in this room today. Uh, and it's working so well, perhaps it won't be our last visit uh, here to Bakersfield, uh, but let's uh, see how we feel at the end of the day today. It's gonna be a long day. Uh, there are gonna be some uh, meeting announcements. Again, this is a new room for us. Um, 
Um, so I'm, I'm gonna make some of those announcements and then we'll pass on the rest to Mr. Areca, who understands the logistics of the room a little bit better than me. If anyone in the audience needs this meeting translated into Spanish, uh, we do have two translators here today, Carlos Diaz de Leon, Luisa Diaz de Leon. Uh, can you please come forward um, and ask if anyone needs translation in Spanish and tell them uh, um, uh, what you're doing. Muy buenos días, Carlos Díaz de León, por parte de la empresa Transline. Estamos proporcionando servicio de traducción simultánea al español para esta conferencia. Si necesita un dispositivo, nos puede pasar a ver en la mesa en la parte posterior del salón. Gracias. Mil gracias, Mr. De León, or Díaz de León. Uh, okay, so um, we have the Spanish translation. Um, uh, there uh, will be public comment periods uh, during each agenda item. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to comment on the specific uh, issue. If you wish to make a comment on one of the agenda items, please fill out a comment card. Uh, these can be found at the back of the room. Once you've filled them out, please give them to Mr. Areca, who's going to raise his hand right now. Um, Mr. Areca, um, are there other announcements particular to the room, please? Yes, sir. Um, in case of emergency, the exits are marked with the red signs, uh, two at the back, one behind me. Uh, the panel will be exiting through the secure area behind the dais. Uh, the bathrooms are also through this exit here to the left and to right out to your left side. So that's it. Thank you, Mr. Areca. Um, my understanding also is that this meeting is being broadcast over the Cal EPA website, is that correct? Yes, Chair. Uh, yes, so uh, you can uh, find uh, this uh, broadcast on the Cal EPA website, and webcast questions can be sent to DTSC public meeting at dtsc.ca.gov. DTSC public meeting at dtsc.ca.gov. Are there any uh, further announcements, uh, colleagues, that you wish to make at this time? I have none. Mr. Recker, are there any other announcements that are needed at this time? Just one, sir. If you do have a comment or a presentation, feel free to bring it to me uh, right here, and uh, I'll take care of it. That's for the public? Yes, sir. Thank you. So colleagues, uh, we have uh, this agenda uh, before us, an agenda that was published in compliance with the Bagley-Keene um, Act um, uh, at least 10 days before this meeting today. And we're assuming that the public and all stakeholders have had the opportunity to look at this agenda. All of the documents uh, um, relating to the agenda items have been posted online uh, and are available also at the back of the room. Um, in particular, um, uh, some of the important action items that we're doing today, colleagues, the draft uh, permitting recommendations for our next report, the draft site mitigation recommendations that may be included in that report were all posted, um, uh, I believe 48 hours before this meeting. So we do hope that the public and other stakeholders have had the opportunity to review those and can give us a meaningful comment as we um, uh, deliberate on those recommendations today. So colleagues, um, we have uh, an item here, uh, agenda review. I'd like to go through the agenda quickly. Um, the next item will be the approval of, of minutes. We have the approval of four different meeting minutes uh, uh, the, and we're discussing and potentially acting to approve those minutes. The next item is the general public comment. The IRP will hear general public comment on issues within the, um, uh, the panel's purview. And my understanding is that we do have a particular presentation which was set up beforehand which may exceed the regular time limits. This is by Mr. Alec Uzemek, who's here today, the co-chair of the community advisory group for the uh, SSFL Boeing site there in Ventura, uh, who's going to be giving us a presentation during general public comment. We've also been advised by Ms. Brostrom at the Center for Race, Poverty, and Environment that many um, of her uh, stakeholders um, um, 
uh, may not be able to be here to give public comment in the regular order um, this morning, and so requested that we also um, um, additionally uh, provide the opportunity for general public comment later in the afternoon, sometime around four or even five o'clock. So we're going to do that unless there's an objection from the panel. The next item, uh, panel members, the next item is the chair report. The chair provides an update on matters within the pur panel's purview that have occurred since the last meeting. The next topic is the staff report. Uh, we're thinking that perhaps this will take us to about uh, 10 a.m. The staff at that time provides an update on matters within the purview that have occurred since the last meeting. Uh, then item nine uh, and, uh, is the, um, um, the IRP reporting requirements. To some extent, this is sort of the meat of our meeting today. Uh, discussion and possible action concerning permitting, site mitigation, and other recommendations for our upcoming report due at the end of April. Uh, the next item is organizational, operational, administrative matters. This is sort of the standing uh, item that we have colleagues for this. Uh, in the past, we have uh, had some heavy duty uh, work in that particular agenda item as we were approving our work plan and approving our um, administrative guidelines. Both of those documents now have been approved, um, so that may not be as lengthy a matter as it has been in past meetings. And I do have some brief discussions I do wanna raise there, so I'm actually thinking about taking that before the permitting so we can sort of get it out of the way instead of leaving it to afterwards. Uh, the next item will be future meeting schedule and agenda items. Uh, the next is going to be closed session. Um, uh, Ms. Barnes, do we have a closed session today? At this time, there is no, uh, no um, nothing to discuss in closed session. So we're likely gonna have no closed session or extremely short one, and then we will adjourn. And again, the agenda takes us to, to 6 p.m. So colleagues, what I'd like to do is to take this in the, um, the general order, but what I would request with the um, other panel members approval is that we sort of allow two time periods for general public comment. One will be coming up shortly, and then we'll have one uh, towards the end of the meeting today to accommodate the uh, members um, and um, participants with the Center for Race, Poverty, and the Environment. And then what I would also like to do, if we can, is reverse the order with numbers nine and 10 and take item 10 up quickly um, um, and sort of think it through and dispense with it uh, and, then, uh, and then take up the much longer item, item nine. So those would be the two changes requested for the agenda. I don't know if there's any feedback or any objection to that, colleagues. I have no objections, but another couple of suggestions. I uh, have no objections either. One of which would be delete the March uh, minute meetings because I don't think we're ready to consider those. Okay. And, and the other, I, I think, however, the chair wants to pursue this, but we've got written comments from DTSC on agenda item number nine and uh, how to appropriate get those into the record or how, how that will be done is something we need to consider. Yes, yeah, we'll definitely do that. I think we may even take a little bit of time. Yes, we'll definitely do that, and we may take a little bit of time um, just to digest those before we, we, we dive into item number nine. Uh, and you know, we also will clarify what other documents have been received on the different agenda items and make sure that it's clear uh, what the record is that we are using to make our deliberations today. Uh, but in terms of the, um, of the order, uh, any other comments, colleagues? Okay, so that'll be the order for the meeting today. I uh, will now move on. Is there any comment, uh, public comment on item uh, four? No, sir. So we'll move on now to item five, the minutes of the December 18th, 2015, and January 13th uh, and 14th, 2015 uh, meetings. Uh, colleagues, any comments on these minutes? I would like to move to approve them. Is there a second? I, I, I second. So we have a motion to approve and second the minutes of December 18th, January 13th, and January 14th. I think we want to thank uh, 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 Mr. Um, uh, Rolfus and um, Mr. Rolfus and um, and. Um, 
Dr. Campbell, who have worked a lot on these uh, 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 minutes, they appear to you know, strike the right balance between uh, being uh, concise enough to, um, to go through them, um, but also detailed enough so that we know exactly what happened uh, during, during the, the meeting. So um, I wanna thank everyone uh, who's participated in making these minutes um, um, uh, satisfy uh, what the panel has asked for. So we have a motion to approve uh, the minutes uh, and a second. Um, Dr. Campbell? Aye. Vice Chair? Aye. Aye. So those minutes are now approved. Also, you know, note for for the record that uh, you know a lot of these meetings for which we are approving the minutes were meetings for which Mr. Rolfus you know wasn't here. So it's been difficult for him to have to go back, listen, you know, basically watch the entire meetings and prepare these minutes. And it's taken um, a tremendous amount of time. Um, on the other hand, it's perhaps been an education for Mr. Um, you know Rolfus on what we're doing and uh, um, and you know, helps to set the foundation for all the work that he's doing for us. Uh, but hopefully now that we are starting to crank through these minutes and get the backlog off of um, ourselves, it will free up our staff to focus more on some of the day-to-day -day stuff. So we're hoping that that occurs. And I know um, Mr. Rolfus, uh, Mr. Rolfus agrees with that. So uh, thank you very much for that. We're now gonna move on to general public comment. The IRP will hear general public comment on issues within the panel's purview. And again, wanna make clear that we're gonna be also hearing general public comment at the end of the meeting for those folks that might perhaps be working today and not have the ability to come uh, this morning. We're gonna provide some opportunity for public comment later in the day. So uh, the first uh, public commenter that I have, uh, and this person has called us ahead, has reserved extra time um, uh, to provide a more detailed presentation. So we're gonna give this person um, uh, 15 minutes, um, is Mr. Alec Uzemek, a co-chair of the Community Advisory Group for the cleanup of the Santa Susana Field Lab in Ventura County. So welcome, uh, Mr. Uzemek. Before you begin, I have these timer controls here. Um, and um, let me see if I can put this to 15 minutes so you sort of know what's going on. Um, again, bear with me, I've never done this before. Um, so, um, and again, I, my understanding is that um, in coming down here from Sacramento, that we might have left the regular comment cards up in Sacramento, so we have a little bit more of an informal procedure um, for comment cards. Mr. Areca, what's going on with the comment cards? Can you tell everyone so we know what to expect? Yes, sir. If you have a comment uh, for any agenda item, please bring it to me with the agenda item that you want to speak on and I'll bring it to the chair. Is there something back there that has these sheets of paper that says um, comment cards? Actually, no, sir, they're right here, okay. right next to me. All right, could you put something up there so folks sort of know to take that from up there to you? Yes, sir. Thank you. Does everyone in the audience seem to understand that? Thank you. Okay, so now we are going to um, start with Mr. Uzemek. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much for letting me speak this morning. Uh, my name is Alec Uzemek, and I'm the co-chair of the Community Advisory Group for the Santa Susana Field Lab Cleanup. And that's located between Ventura County and Los Angeles. Our group was set up three years ago uh, under the California Health Act with the help of DTSC and consultants. And we started out and still have a very technical group. We've got a couple of PhDs, one of whom is a nuclear engineer. Um, we have a neurologist, we have an anthropologist, we have a number of MS and MBA degrees in engineering and uh, some uh, two, two fellows have their own consulting firms in, for environment, and we, of course, have environment activists. After three years, we have concluded that the SSFL is contaminated in portions of the site, 
and those require a responsible cleanup. DTSC will be uh, issuing their environmental impact report. Uh, they say by mid-year, I would suspect it would be a little bit later. Uh, and that brings us to the disagreement. Very brief history, in 2007, uh, NASA DOE and uh, Boeing signed an agreement of consent contract with DTSC to clean up the site to uh, allow it to be used as open space. Uh, Boeing raised the ante a little bit. They said, well, uh, we'll even go to suburban residential, which is a higher uh, standard, fine. In 2010, under significant uh, political pressure, uh, NASA and DOE signed a new AOC agreement um, that was prepared by some uh, two fellows who have little or no science background. The problem with this new agreement is that it doesn't consider human health. It's based on uh, you go in, sample the soil, and if there's any chemical that's above background, you dig it up. Or this list of 300 chemicals, if you find any of the 300, you dig it up. Of the 300, less than 30 are toxic. So what happens is we anticipate that under that uh, revised AOC contract, there'll be about eight times as much soil removed as the EPA, the US EPA method that's used throughout the United States. Um, eight times as much, but more importantly, it wipes out our history. There are caves with paintings that are on the National, Historical Regi uh, National Register of Historical Sites. There are rocket stands that have been there 50 years and have tested every engine for space for the United States. Plus, it wipes out a wildlife corridor, which of course is important to maintain DNA uh, diversity. And of course, the dust and trucks will go through our area. The neighborhood councils for West Hills, Chatsworth, and Woodland Hills have all called for an EPA reasonable cleanup. US EPA throughout the rest of the United States, not this hybrid. This AOC doesn't even allow statistics. The confirmation sampling will be one sample if it doesn't meet no statistics, dig it up. So, I'm running well ahead of my schedule here, thank you. I have some pictures. This first picture is a site that was cleaned up uh, to background. It was necessary, it was contaminated, but this is one or two uh, acres, and that is a man standing at the left you can see the relative site. And I apologize, I didn't have time to put this on digital. The second picture is of test stands, and there are three test stands left, uh, Alpha, Brava, and Coca. And uh, of course, they are all inactive now, but nevertheless, they are there, and they are a reminder of our past. The third picture is one of Indian paintings in one of the caves, and of course, the location of the caves is kept secret so that we don't have vandals or anything else until um, the, the tribe is brought in to take control. The tribe is the Chumash tribe, nationally recognized, to federally recognized in 1905, something like that. There have been comments that they're going to build a casino. You cannot build a casino. They are purchasing the land in the same context as you or I would purchase it. Uh, fee simple. It's not going to be a sovereign nation or anything else, and it's not going to be a casino. The Chumash consider that sacred land. 
Chumash is a very responsible tribe, by the way. I was surprised that they had developed their own dictionary. And considering it's an ancient language, I don't know how they did it, but uh, they're very um, careful about their history and they have established various museums uh, throughout California. In fact, there's one a couple of miles from my house. The last picture is what the site is. And if you look at the site, that's uh, San Fernando Valley in the background. And the foreground is the site, and most of the buildings have been eliminated, reduced, or uh, demolished. So what am I asking for? Please, please go back to DTSC and tell them to use the US EPA method for these two AOCs for NASA and DOE. They must identify by risk, human risk, and if it's not a human risk, then leave it alone. Don't dig it up to be digging up things. There have been uh, comments made that the contamination it flows down the hill when it rains and there are other movements which cause cancer and so on. Serious subject. There have been eight multi-million dollar health studies that have been made that say there is no correlation between that site and cancer and they've gone through the cancer registry, they've looked at it, eight of them. So, there are two other studies that are quoted, one of which is conclusive, inconclusive. It shows some cancers increase the closer you get to SSFL, others decrease. And the, the, the author ends by saying uh, there's insufficient data and perhaps SSFL should be looked at, but he didn't recommend it. The other study that's often quoted is one of conjecture. What if this happens, that happens, and so on? Is there a pathway to the communities? And the answer is yes. Well, except the report never had any peer review. It didn't have any questions asked, and the assumptions are at an extreme level. So back once again, please let's use a method that is recognized by the United States throughout the United States. And I think it's a very valuable method. It's called the US EPA Guidelines for Cleanup. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, any questions for the panelists? Uh, yeah. uh, I have one. It's actually two, two questions. Uh, what other uh, bodies have you presented your concerns to and did, they and, and did any of them uh, provide a response? And if so, what was it? What other bodies have we spoken to? Yeah, about these specific concerns about this, this contract, which... We, we've uh, spoken to DTSC significantly. Mark Malinowski, we've spoken to Ray LeClerc, and to uh, the new director, Barbara Lee. And we have expressed these significantly over the past three years. We met with various politicians. And I, I'm telling you, I'm not surrounded by politicians. You won't see any of them backing me up except that I have three neighborhood councils that represent over 100,000 people who say they want a reasonable cleanup. What was this? But, but, but none of the uh, official bodies have given you a formal response to your concerns. Is, or ha if they have, what or the, was that response? They are proceeding with those contracts, the revised contracts. And um, the political establishment says that they are on the side of those contracts. Quite often we talk to them and they don't understand the details of it, but nevertheless they are on the side of those contracts. Uh, uh, of the existing, the, the, the contract that you describe here, 
the, 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 uh, the reason I'm confused is it would appear to me that uh, as you mount eight times the amount of soil to be removed that would normally be required to meet the cleanup standards following EPA's cleanup guidelines, and that would be an additional expense to uh, to Boeing and Department of Energy and any other parties that are involved in the cleanup, and so I, I. I'm at a loss to understand why this is uh, occurring this way, and that's why I'm curious if, if anybody has responded to explain why that uh, determination was made or why that contract was signed in that fashion. Uh, as I say, the two fellows that wrote this up, I got their emails, some 300 emails through the Freedom of Information Act, and they ha have little or no scientific background. And they are saying, basically, scrape the mountain down until there's nothing above background, a reference area, or this list of 300 chemicals. But there's nothing in there that says, leave the stuff alone that is not harmful. So this eight times includes soil that may not be harmful, but it's different. Um, this is a stupid example. Mayonnaise slips off your sandwich and falls on the ground. It's considered a foreign object and you dig it out. Well, the question is, is it harmful? Uh, the eight times is stripping the area and having no consideration for human health. Is it a risk to human health? Nevertheless, they want to strip it off. And that's what's so harmful. So much of that soil. Question, Dr. Yeah, I was just wondering, it seems that they want to do a more extensive cleanup compared to what uh, you feel might be required as a way to protect human health. Um, we have heard from other entities who have been concerned about this site. So it may have been that because you want to satiate the some of the people who are concerned with chemicals that they feel may be harmful, that they are now taking this kind of an extremist movement where they're going to go ahead and remove uh, all of the soil so that there would be no concerns with human health. How would you respond to that? Uh, yes, they, they have concerns, but as I said, we've done it. Uh, we have eight health studies that have been done by ATSDR, which is part of CDC, other agencies, and they say there, that there is no concern off-site today, including the mayor of CME and the DTSC itself has said there is no concern off-site. So the, the um, proposition of removing all of the soil is not necessary because the um, soil characterization has been completed. They know where the contamination is and they know what the acceptable levels are by US EPA standards. So why dig up all the rest of the stuff that is not necessary? Um, I guess I want to go back to what uh, Vice Chair Vizier was pointing to. Have you had a chance to express your concerns in a meeting where all of the stakeholders were present, not just DTSC, but also some of the concerned citizens who have been discussing the potential health hazards and their concerns? Uh, has there been a forum where everyone could communicate? Yes, uh, we have done this for three neighborhood councils, as I said, uh, represent uh, over 100,000 residents. We've done it in open meetings. I have invi invited um, members of this other group, the work group, to come join the CAG, come join us so that we have a diversity of opinion on the CAG. They refused. They said they will not join any uh, organization where they do not control um, agenda and so on. I've asked them to come speak at the meetings. None of them speak to the meetings. So I think, I think they're uh, trying to ignore us. But in fact, I think we represent more re uh, residents than they do. Uh, I think I, I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Anything further? 
No. So uh, are you, wait, the comment that you're making today, Mr. Azemek, are they made on behalf of the CAG? The what? Are, are the comments you're making today, the points that you are making, are, are you speaking on behalf of the CAG that's authorized you to make these comments today? Yes, sir. Okay. And how about the West Hills Neighborhood Council? Uh, have they off, uh, have they taken a position that you were coming to express to us today? No, I'm not representing the West Hills Neighborhood Council. I am a member, but I'm simply saying um, that they have issued resolutions in support of this position as Chatsworth and uh, uh, Woodland Hills and Bell Canyon, which is immediately adjacent to SSFL. We're concerned. Well, these na neighbors um, are the most effective. They're in the path. Understood. Thank you very much for your time and for coming out and speaking with us today. Thank you for giving me your time. Thank you. The next uh, public commenter is Ms. Uh, Mara Salatori. Good morning, panel. Um, I wanted to thank you for um, having me on that nice tour yesterday. Uh, I've tried to take that tour before, but I've never been allowed, so it was uh, pretty eye-opening. Um, I wanted to come out and make sure that I mentioned civil rights compliance again. Um, DTSC can't continue to wash their hands of Title VI uh, civil rights laws by passing the buck. And I've constantly uh, heard that they're not responsible for um, documents created by other entities, whether they follow civil rights laws or not. But in my view, if they're using those documents for permitting decisions, then they need to make sure that whatever agency created them uh, was following civil rights laws as well. And case in point, in Kittleman City, uh, um, they relied on an EIR for the expansion project of uh, chemical uh, waste, uh, Kettleman City, um, in a process that Kings County used um, canine uh, uh, dogs at meetings. They didn't translate documents. They uh, gave Spanish speakers half the time to speak as English speakers. And then um, they said that they're not responsible for all that because that was Kings County. And that's fine. Uh, I'll, I'll accept that, that that was Kings County. But when they turn around and use that document, um, in their permitting process, then that is their responsibility. And they're saying that they're above civil rights laws, and I, I don't think that that's correct. I mean, I don't think that um, there's a tier of laws that they have to follow and civil rights is at the bottom. I think that they just have to follow them like everybody else in the United States. Um, I also wanted to uh, speak again about statements of overriding consideration. I think that the public has a false sense of security. Um, they think that there's laws to uh, protect them, and that there's all these strict laws that are gonna protect you, but they don't realize that as long as DTSC can use statements of overriding consideration, we really aren't as safe as we think. Um, well, correction, you're safe as long as you're not in a low-income community of color because this is where they're using statements of overriding consideration to uh, push projects through. They'll say, oh, this project is gonna have a negative impact on the environment for X reasons, but uh, because industry needs this place to dump their hazardous waste, then we're gonna use a statement of overriding consideration to push it through anyway. So um, uh, that, that leaves these communities that are already vulnerable at the mercy of DTSC and these uh, bad decisions. And I think that's morally, ethically incorrect. You cannot continue to dump on vulnerable communities, push projects through, and say that, um, you know, that you're following civil rights laws, that you're protecting communities. You can't say that. It's, it's false. So I just wanted to, uh, again, uh, speak my mind on uh, civil rights and the statements of overriding consideration. I think that um, until DTSC uh, stops using those, then they're not protecting vulnerable communities like mine, like Kettleman City. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much, and thank you for uh, attending uh, yesterday and for helping the panel understand the challenges that face um, the community of Kettleman City, um, uh, which are um, quite apparent, uh, quite um, you know moving, um, and of which you know the Kemways facility is just one. So that really is a is a community and there are many others in the state uh, that deserve a whole heck of a lot more attention. The next public commenter is uh, Dr. Esparza from the Clean Water Fund. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Rosana Esparza. I'm a PhD in gerontology. I specialize in lifespan development. What I'm here to talk about this morning is the Elk Hills cleanup. <clears throat> Very concerned that we're not looking at the health impacts and the health effects of residents in the communities of Tupman and in McKittrick. These two areas are fence line communities, and as we've already discussed, fence line communities are the ones that are most at risk for any environmental impacts and hazards. When you consider that both of these areas also host elementary schools, what we know about child development suggests to us that these are children in the most formidable stages of development with exposure to toxicity, and over time, they're taking in more and more and more. The school in Tupman is less than 50 yards away from a fence line area, and that is the Elk Hills cleanup. We've talked with DTSC, we've had meetings over the past two years, and all we're asking for is information about when is this gonna happen? When will the cleanup begin? And we're talking specifically about the area of 140 areas of concern. We're concerned about this because these are public health impacts. The cost to our community, the cost to the individual, and to our culture in general, those costs are very high. Human life is at stake here. And we wanna know, how long is it going to take for that Elk Hills project to finally be implemented? This property was sold in 1998 as part of a condition of the sale, it was to clean that within the 10 months of the sale of that property to Occidental. That's 1997. I believe we're in 2016 now. It's been more than a couple of months. It's been many, many months. We've not had a response back from DTSC or the staff that has been assigned to the area, specifically Elk Hills. When we had a community meeting in Tupman and the community came out, any question we asked was referred back to request a public information document. Well, what was the point of having a community meeting when the only information we were going to get back was process more paper? When we took out our cell phones and started taking pictures of the information that was placed up for public view, we were told that we needed to remove that from our cell phones. Seems to me that we have some rights here in this United States that were violated, and that is the freedom of information. If DTSC can speak about it, and it has opportunities to share that information with the public, they've already chosen to make it public. I'm very concerned as a woman who is a woman of color, one who has experienced living in fence line communities, I purposely chose to come to Kern County. I'm originally from Pasadena, I had a very nice life in Pasadena, but my commitment to the health and safety of all our people in California was my choosing to come here. I would really appreciate if this can be looked into, that answers can be provided, and we know how much money has been spent. We've heard it's upwards of $80 million on just reports. We're just asking for some solid responses to the questions that we've put forward. Thank you.
Okay, I'm having all kinds of trouble here with the, uh, with the timer. Mrs. Sparza, can you come, come back for a sec? So you're here to talk to us about the Occidental of Elk Hills project in Tupman? Yes. So this project was on the People's Senate site-specific benchmarks as part of the uh, request the People's Senate made when Director Lee was confirmed, um, uh, I think that was 2015 or uh, 2014, is that correct? Correct. So there were four things that were asked for there including um, justification for removing certain areas of concern, testing of certain wells, providing a schedule for cleanup and closure, and providing an accounting of funds expended since 1997? Correct. And what do you think, uh, uh, strike that. You've got responses to those? Well, responses that we've had back to those <coughs> questions is, Save that for a future meeting. Uh, when we asked Mr. Fitster, who was a project manager, we were told that he has no accounting of the amount of money that's been spent heretofore, and that they are working with a subcontractor, uh, A.H., what is their name? <clears throat> Athna, A-H-T-N-A facilities so that they were responsible with coming up with a solid number of how much money has been spent on this project. We've heard anywhere from $80 million to $100,000. What we do know is two areas of concern have been cleaned. One was a radio uh, shack that was used for communications when the property was owned by the Navy. Another one was a storage shed that had equipment. This is an area where oil and gas development was at a peak. It's also an area where we've seen, and many residents will have suggested that they've seen trucks coming in from Bell Ridge, from the areas on the western edge of Kern County, to inject wastewater into those wells. If that's the case, then we have a whole Another issue that's at stake here. Okay, so, well, the question I ask you is: um, as you just, uh, the here, has, has the department responded to these questions you asked? No. So you feel that the questions that you asked as part of Bar Barbara Lee's confirmation in this People Senate benchmarks are still questions you need answers to? Yes, we would like that. Thank you. Any additional questions for Mrs. Sparsa? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Thank we really you. appreciate it. We're listening. Mr. Rep, I'm having trouble with the timer controls. Would you mind coming up here and helping me understand them? Like 
So colleagues, do we want to try to wait to fix this or should we just um, kind of crank through and we can keep time manually? I, I recommend manual. <laughs> Thank you. And, and in the chairs, the fifth, the screen looks pretty complicated to me. Yeah. <laughs> There's quite a bit more than just one on off switch, let's put it that way. <laughs> The next commenter is Ms. Brostrom. Uh, good morning, I wanted to talk about, uh, to make two comments today. Um, the first, I, I did want to provide a little context for the Santa Susana site, uh, seeing that um, they are representative of the People Senate um, and have been working on getting a full cleanup for a long time. And also to provide some context in what is a uh, very complicated and somewhat acrimonious situation in Santa Susana. Your time I, is up, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, and I won't belabor the point, but I did want to at least make sure that the IRP knew um, that there is some, um, there was a great deal of distrust uh, of the CAG um, in, in that area um, from the longtime Santa Susana residents. Um, and this is primarily uh, because uh, many uh, who are on the CAG are thought to be surrogates for Boeing. It's what they consider a astroturf group. Um, and so when this panel um, weighs the credibility and the information that is presented to it, I would encourage you to look behind the source. Um, I, I believe the presenter today um, may have some close connections with Boeing, and I know that many others on the CAG does, and this is, of course, the responsible party who's in charge of cleaning up the site. So I did want to at least make sure uh, that the IRP knew that this was contentious and that there's a lot of allegations um, that the CAG may be connected to the responsible party. So moving on, um, what I really wanted to spend most of my comment um, talking about um, and I gave this considerable thought before coming in and, and letting you know, um, but in the last several months, something new has been happening for me and, and all the time that I've work, been working on DTSE issues. I've been reached out to by numerous DTSE staff that are very concerned about their department and they're coming to me as an advocate outside that is trying to make DTSE better. And I've been contacted separately by between 14 and 15 different staff and they are all saying the same thing to me, which is their department is failing, is falling down on the job, that the morale at the agency is the lowest it has ever been in the department's history, that the performance at the agency is the lowest it's ever been in its history, that there's an incredibly high turnover uh, where there's no institutional knowledge of how things have traditionally been done and there's not a, a, the people that are being brought on do not have the skills to take on the work they're being assigned to and there's inadequate training. Um, they've made other allegations concerning um, uh, disincentives to, to do full investigations, to find class one violations at, at facilities because of the, the amount of work it would take. Um, I've been told there's an unofficial work slowdown due to the low morale and the failure of the department to address it for many, many years now. So these things are concerning, of course, because the impact of the failures of the department has a direct impact on communities near hazardous waste sites and, uh, and cleanup um, contaminated sites. So as an advocate, it's difficult for me to know what to do with this information. I've been compiling it and collecting it and I've decided today to come to you to let you know, you know, as their mouthpiece, that this, the staff at DTSE are very, very concerned, at, as am I. I also wanted to let you know that at the last IRP meeting, Barbara's comments um, in response to the IRP suggestion of going and visiting the different uh, uh, regional offices had a very big chilling effect and it confirmed for many staff um, uh, that Barbara does not want this body to know what's going on and that they are not to speak about these problems publicly. So. 
I understand that the IRP is the only accountability body that we have right now looking at DTSC. And so that's why many of us are looking to you, um, understanding that it is a huge undertaking. So I, I would ask you know, two things. One, is there a way that the IRP can fill this space and understand that the staff have the best knowledge and the best historical context of what's going on at the agency rather than relying at only from the top officials to hear what's really going on at the agency? And then two, if the IRP determines that it cannot fill this space, then can it make a recommendation for structures that will work, whether it be a whistleblower protection body or an internal auditor, um, somewhere where the true story can get out and so that we can really get to the bottom of it. So um, I'm happy to share more about the comments I've received, making sure that I keep everyone's identity confidential. Um, but I did want to let you know and at least start this conversation happening about how can we, how can we use the, the information that's coming out right now from the internal staff. Thank you. Have you talked um, with the director about these um, concerns uh, uh, that you're receiving? No, but I know that some of them have sent the same comments they've sent to me to her. When's the last time you talked to the director? Not for a, well, I talked to her very briefly at a hazardous waste reduction advisory panel that I'm a member of and she, we said hi. But, but when's the last time you had a substantive discussion with her? Not since she was confirmed the day before her confirmation. When was that? Uh, d uh, 2014, end of 2014. So you're telling me that as the coordinator of the People's Senate, you have not had a substantive discussion with the director for over a year? Correct. Any co questions for Ms. Brostrom right now? I have none. The next... The next uh, public commenter is Jane Williams. Ms. Williams, did you want to speak in general comments or did you want to talk during the permitting action item? Or both? No. I'll speak now and then. Okay. And uh, I've given the um, disclosure that I uh, have represented uh, Ms. Williams previously and I've been advised that I don't have to give that disclosure every time that you appear before us. Please go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm happy to hear your voice. You can give it any time you want. Dr. Campbell, Mr. Vizier, Mr. Krakoff, um, I applaud your stamina. This is a lot of work and I so much appreciate it, I cannot tell you. Um, I wanted to let you know that next to the Santa Susana facility is one of the few clusters of children that are born with retinoblastoma in the entire country. Uh, retinoblastoma is a cancer of the optic nerve, incredibly rare. And there are nine children that live next to the Santa Susana field lab that have been um, diagnosed with that cancer over the last eight years. And that Dr. Beata Ritz did um, a huge epidemiological study, she's with UCLA, and found um, increased, increased uh, different kinds of cancers, I can't remember, it was a very long time ago now. So the Santa Susana Field Lab is one of the places in California where um, cancer clusters have actually been most documented. And so there is, um, very much concerns, especially from a children's environmental health perspective, on um, the extent of that cleanup and how long it is taken and uh, reversal of policy, ironically, between a Republican administration that advocated for much more extensive cleanup than uh, this administration has. So I wanted to point that out to you. And I also wanted, in general, um, I will save my permitting comments for the permitting section but it's very interesting to me that you we've been able to get this financial assurance data. This is the first time I've been able to see this, right? Um, and I wanted, there's a, just interesting um, observations about this financial assurance data that, as you know, one of the uh, new, one of the permits 
that we're going to be looking at, that's the department is going to be permitting, one of the facilities is FibroTech. And it looks like they don't have any post-closure um, financial assurance, which is, you know, it's, it's a hazardous waste treatment facility and the closure bond um, is only $1.8 million. So I don't know what kind of recommendations the IRP is gonna make. I also noticed that um, China Lake Naval Weapons Center, which has become this huge open burning, open detonation facility, it open burns, it's one of the largest open burning, open detonation facilities in the entire country now. It open burns, open detonates more than five million pounds of materials a year. It brings waste in from we're not actually sure where, and we have a number of whistleblowers that have um, over the years contacted us talking about um, that they may be exploding depleted uranium, that they may be exploding all kinds of crazy stuff that would be extremely damaging to the environment. And of course, they're exempt from um, a post-closure bond or um, financial assurance for corrective action. So um, I'm not sure what recommendations you're, of course, I could keep going on. I could go through every single one of these pieces of paper and I could say, if we're not demanding post-closure bonds or closure bonds that are realistic, then we're gonna be in the same position that we are with Exide, where you know the people of California are paying a small fortune, which at Exide will be you know, upwards of over half a billion dollars eventually. So I, I wanna just point, I just wanna take this time that I have in front of you to point out to you the incredible importance of tackling this issue of the closure bonds and the post-closure corrective action bonds. And I don't know how we would go about getting the agency to actually take a look at what kind of amounts those bonds should be, but they are, of course, this is the environmental economist in me speaking, I mean, um, very much underfunded by many, many hundreds of millions of dollars, and those costs will inevitably be passed on to the taxpayers. So with that, I just give you that to think about as something that we really need to tackle in this process. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Ms. Williams. Any questions for Ms. Williams at this time? Yeah, we are looking at that. It's in the recommendations we're gonna be talking about later today, so we'll have an opportunity to speak more about that. Yeah, that's why I wanted to bring it to your attention. It's a very, very important issue. Thank you. The next speaker is Ms. Babich. Good morning. How's Good morning. everybody doing today? Good? Yeah. Working hard, I can see. So that's my first comment. I just want to say that I've been reviewing the documents that you guys have been providing and you have been working very hard and I hope you know how much your work is appreciated. Um, I think that the problems that you guys are addressing and the problems with the agency obviously are long overdue to be addressed and I really appreciate the way that um, you're going about addressing them. We don't need more conflict in a very conflicted situation. Um, some calmness, some uh, real information that we can hang our hats on, some that Ms. Williams just spoke of is really important. I did want to mention that I think that around the voluntary cleanup program, um, there definitely needs to be more transparency. I've read um, some of the comments that DTSC is doing around enhanced public participation and they're talking for more community oversight. I don't necessarily think that CAGs or CAPs or some of these canned stakeholder groups are the answer, but certainly the people affected that are living around these sites should uh, have more weight in the decisions that are being made. And I bring attention to the ECI, Ecology Controls Industries property in Torrance, which is really my only um, experience with the voluntary cleanup program where it is part of a Superfund site and because the owner and operator unpermitted of that facility decided that he wanted to put um, homes on there, they went to DTSC and entered to a voluntary cleanup program, which once they dug into the toxic wastes of the Superfund site kind of changed the parameters of the cleanup and now there's a big stockpile of soil that the EPA may or may not be looking at shipping off to somebody else's community to deal with. 
and um, there's just a lot of confusion. And so we are constantly inserting ourselves into the process and it sure would be a lot easier if we were invited to the table and our expertise around that site um, were more acknowledged. Um, I also wanted to mention about um, DTSC Director Lee and the staff. And I know that um, some staff that I work with with DS DTSC have reached out to me as well and I've always encouraged them to reach out to you. Telling me something and telling you something are I think two different things. And um, I've tried to work with many of the directors that have come before Director Lee and um, we seem to have good communication until they bail on us and leave for whatever reasons, maybe too much stress, maybe better job offers. And I think that it's very overwhelming for anybody in that position to deal with all these problems that are very serious and very real. Um, but I am choosing to try and support the efforts of the director and of staff that are trying to get a handle on their work situation. I've talked before to this group about how demoralizing it must be, and I think we've heard some testimony um, today about those staff reaching out to others because of this um, uncertainty and demoralization, hearing about emails and all the things that we know about are very important to bring to light, but. I think we need to keep focused on trying to solve a problem because I really am concerned that um, if folks just don't like this person and they don't like that person, what is gonna come in its place? Do we keep having to start over again from scratch with each new person that comes in? And so I would hope that if in the future people are gonna be replaced, that people who are pushing for that really think long and hard about what that replacement would look like. And does that mean that we always have to keep starting, um, you know, back to square one? Um, I too have been allowed to participate in the Community Protection and Hazardous Waste Reduction Advisory Panel, which um, I really appreciate because I really don't think it's appropriate to send toxic waste from one community to another. And in working with this group have realized that we've surrounded our community now with toxic soil piles because we don't see good remediations at hand and we just don't simply want to pass it on to somebody else, including Kettleman City. And so we hope that um, when we look at cleanups that we're making sure that we look at the innovative technologies and really trying to find much better solutions than we have at hand. So thank you for all your hard work and for um, listening to me today. Thank you, Ms. Babich. Any questions? Uh, Vice Chair? Yeah, just a, a, a general comment, I think. Uh, for all the people making public comments that uh, you know, we, we've put out this work plan and, and I, appreci I appreciate you, uh, I think persistence matters in bringing it up, uh, you know, items again, but when we get to the quarter in which we want to examine these issues in more depth and really refine our understanding of them and make perhaps enhanced or longer term uh, recommendations, we really appreciate uh, perhaps a little bit longer longer uh, presentation so that we fully understand. For, for instance, public outreach coming up, uh, uh, for which you mentioned that they should b do a better job of engaging you and other community experts. Uh, that would be, I think, an appropriate, uh, also like to hear from you again on those is what I'm trying to say. And, and more detail and perhaps better, you know, with some documentation so that we can make sure we understand your concerns. Certainly, okay. be happy to. Thank you. Thank you, anything further for Ms. Babbage? Dr. Campbell? I just wanted to mention that it is very important to point things out to us, uh, especially the things that the statute allows us to uh, 
place recommendations for. Uh, there's some other issues that uh, was mentioned before regarding, for example, the staff dissatisfaction at DTSC. Uh, that is a concern to us, but unfortunately, it is difficult to see how, based on our uh, role uh, as an independent review panel, we can really do anything to allow us to, in a fundamental way, to help or in any way uh, try to integrate it into our reports. So if there's any way that you feel that that information helps us with our role, our responsibility, I personally would really appreciate it if you could provide a framework of how we can utilize that information. Because we hear a lot of information, uh, but some of it is information that of course, we care about, but it's very difficult for us to see how we can integrate it into our recommendations for DTSC uh, in regards to what we have been told is our role. So for me, it's hard for me to hear certain comments that are made, but to be completely, uh, and not know, have the knowledge of knowing how I can integrate that into this important responsibility that is given to us. So I would really appreciate it if uh, when those comments are made, there is some kind of a, uh, uh, maybe you can tell us how we can utilize that information to kind of do what we need to do. Points well made. Uh, Vice Chair, you had a comment? Yeah, just, I, I think to go to exactly what uh, Dr. Campbell's bringing up, uh, and I, I do not remember this study, but you know, we talk about employee morale, job satisfaction, the, the number one and th this is the 10 or 20 year study about it. Number one thing is tools to do their job. And, and what the statute does require us to do is look at the fundamental tools to, to do their job. And I think we, uh, we could go a long way. Uh, better public outreach, better permitting, better, yeah, all of those, fiscal stability counts for everybody. You know, th those sort of things are tools that help the staff do their job and, and would greatly uh, in, in enhance morale. So I, I, I think they're very closely linked, actually. I think also just to um, respond to Ms. Campbell that um, you are helping the staff by straightening out some of these problems with the agency. I think that the staff that work at um, the agency by and large are people who care about the environment and sometimes people migrate towards certain jobs thinking they're gonna make this resounding difference and sometimes they do and sometimes they're stopped short in their tracks and so really uplifting those folks because we certainly don't want them to go to the better paying jobs at the chemical industry and, and other places like that. But I think that you are helping. You're helping the staff a great deal. Thank you Thank so you. much. Appreciate that. Any additional public comment at this time? Any additional public comment at this time? Okay, hearing none, we're going to continue that agenda item to later in the day and open it up if necessary towards the end of the day for additional commenters who are coming after work. We'll now move on, um, uh, panelists, to item number seven, which is the chair report. The chair will provide an update on matters within the panel's purview that have occurred since the last meeting. And I've thought a lot about this report as well. And I know Ms. Brostrom talked about some of the things she's been thinking about and I also had to think about what I was going to say. Um, but first, just sort of a couple of little updates. The first is that uh, my understanding is um, uh, AB 118, which is the f uh, funding mechanism for the $176.6 million for the Exide cleanup, um, is now working its way through the legislature. I think it might have taken some initial uh, steps uh, yesterday, uh, but my understanding is that uh, it is likely that that Exide appropriation um, is going to pass through the legislature soon. There's been, my understanding, a lot of back and forth and difficulty over the 30 days about the uh, CEQA exemption. Uh, if you recall, the governor's initial proposal indicated that there should be some sort of special standalone CEQA exemption for the Exide residential cleanup. 
many folks in the community were strongly opposed to that. My understanding is that that is not gonna be present and has been removed from what is going forward uh, in AB 118. Um, but the issue about how the department's gonna deal with CEQA uh, is an issue that um, uh, is going to be uh, still on the table and hopefully their smart minds can um, come up with a um, uh, approach to CEQA uh, that, that balances the need for um, a transparency and a human health protection uh, while also getting this cleanup uh, going. Um, the next thing I'd like to identify is that I too have been receiving a lot of these emails, uh, either directly or from um, Ms. Brostrom. Uh, obviously in an agency of a thousand people, there are gonna be people that are not happy. There are gonna be staff members that are um, upset. Um, so um, it's difficult to make conclusions um, from what you're getting from certain people. You know, that being said, just the sheer volume of different concerns about many issues, specific issues I'm seeing here about enforcement problems at particular facilities, that e-waste inspections are drastically reduced because um, of staff morale, uh, issues about informal staff slowdowns, uh, unofficial work slowdowns, uh, the issues about the scientists, the minority scientists, uh, um, uh, issues that the DTSC's Office of Civil Rights is you know, no more than a fig leaf that doesn't do anything. Uh, you know, these are the kinds of emails that I am getting, and I, perhaps you are getting too, panelists, and um, these are issues that are of concern. Um, Again, it's a question as to how we as the panel interact with these kinds of concerns. Uh, and I'm, it's certainly not an easy assignment, but it's not something we can stick our head in the sand with either. Um, um, so um, I did, did wanna just identify for the record that I have been getting these kinds of emails and I'm reading uh, these emails. Another update is that uh, Josh Tooker, uh, who I believe was the uh, legislative liaison for DTSC and or uh, legislative deputy, uh, has left the agency, has now gone back to the legislature uh, where he is the chief consultant, a, a very important um, position uh, at the assembly um, uh, 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 Environmental Safety and Toxics Committee. Uh, so that is a significant loss for the department. Um, um, but we wish um, Mr. Tooker well, and uh, I believe that he approached our panel with, with good spirit um, and um, really made an effort to, um, to make our panel function, uh, especially in the beginning when he was sort of the direct liaison between us and, um, and the department, so want to wish him well. Um, um, uh, have sent out um, to some folks um, uh, requests that they, you know, perhaps indicate who might be good to fill those shoes, um, uh, which is an important position at the department. Um, and. Um, you know, in response from some of the folks in the EJ community, I get emails like this. The historical lack of access has limited the development and pool of qualified individuals to step into leadership positions that understand how to equitably and responsibly carry out the mission of the department. You know, or people saying, you know, why would folks, you know, want to go to the department um, when the department doesn't stand, understand environmental justice? So I get emails like that. What I tell these people is, listen, if, if we don't make the effort to step up and try to improve this department and get people in these positions that understand the different perspectives, you know, then we are not going to make progress. So it's the same reason why the panelists up here decided to take this on, why our staff has decided to come to this agency while all the folks from the public and other stakeholders are participating because if we don't try, uh, we're not going to be able to make things better. So I'm certainly discouraged by responses like that, uh, but that is what I'm, I'm telling folks. Um, I have another sort of larger comment that I wanna make um, uh, and then we can you know, open up for feedback from the, from the panel perhaps on these topics. So, um, I, I want to, you know, we've been at this now for six months, 
And um, um, I want you know, to describe to the panel some observations that I think are appropriate as the chair to sort of make at this time. Um, the, the first is um, we you know, have these very important permitting recommendations today. And um, in the course of preparing these with our staff, I reached out to Director Lee, um, who I've really worked hard to try to have a good uh, line of communication with and an open and clear relationship with, and tried to talk to her about these recommendations, as I do with many other people, even before they're published so that I can make sure that what we put in paper and the draft publish document makes sense, that I get the feedback from people, that the ideas that we have aren't completely out of the blue. Um, and I feel that that was very important to our mission to make sure that we have good, solid recommendations, you know, even in draft form. And I had done this with the director and had a good conversation with her, I believe, back in December or January when we made our initial uh, recommendations. Not that the director has special access or anything of those lines, but she is certainly one of the stakeholders that we need to hear from as we're preparing these, these permitting recommendations. And I was extremely disappointed that the director did not bother to call me back. So uh, this was an offer to try to encourage working with the department to have a relationship that even before something's published, I discuss it, learn from the director's perspective, uh, and she did not call back. And I'm learning that this is now a repeated problem I am having. I, in March, I had reached out to the director to talk about some issues at the meeting. It took two weeks to get a response. Uh, and I understand that there are some, the director's extremely busy, has a lot to do, perhaps too much to do. Um, but I still recognize she's got a department of a thousand people and surely, if they're taking our role seriously, somebody should get back to the chair of this panel to talk through permitting recommendations when a call is timely made to discuss them. So that's an observation that I do wanna share with the panel that I think is important to make. Another thing is um, some other observations. We have asked, and I think quite clearly, made a request for information on the financial assurances for corrective action. We had a whole back and forth with the department's pretty competent um, financial assurance staff about what we wanted, which basically was a very simple question. What of the, reg of the permitted facilities have financial assurances for corrective action? It's a simple question. And what we got back is such a complicated answer that still, months and months after we made this request, does not answer the question. Which of the facilities have financial assurances for corrective action, you know, and how much are they? And we get this grid back that has some degree of these answers for to some extent, the closure amount and the post-closure amount. But I don't even see on here anything about corrective action. It's not even on the grid. And then there's an attachment which has some explanations. But in the end, we still don't have the information which of these facilities has corrective action, financial assurances, and how much are they? I mean, how many times do we have to ask this question? So it's a waste of everybody's time. And we've got this, and I understand it's a lot of work to put this together, but it doesn't answer the question. I also, um, we made a request to go and visit the different DTSC branch offices and had a little bit of a discussion about this at the last meeting. And this is not gonna be a dead issue, but the director you know, strongly insisted that we should not, somehow that it's going to um, um, detract the staff from their jobs as if you, Dr. Campbell, going to the Cypress office for two hours to check in once during the course of our panel activities is somehow going to distract the staff from their core responsibilities. I don't accept that argument. Um, and then I hear complaints. The panel is trying to do too much. We're making the department work too hard. It's too hard for the department to put together these presentations. So I think it's important that we identify these concerns that are going on. And I think it's important that I share some of the conclusions that I'm drawing from all of this background. The first is, I am concerned um, that the department really views our panel sort of as an irritant. 
um, and that in their view, they will give us sort of the, the, the basic support. And Mr. Law is here, the only person here from the department today. And Mr. Law has been with the department maybe three or four months, even though we're considering extremely important recommendations today that the director did not bother to talk to me about when I asked her. Um, so we're getting minimal support or the bare minimum of support. Um, and I think there's sort of, in my view, maybe the department um, you know, really just hopes that all these reports that we're writing go on the shelf and gather dust like a lot of the other reports that have been indicated. I'm really concerned about how much the department really wants us to succeed as a panel. The other thing, and I've got three or more observations. So the question is, well, what do we do? How do we stay relevant? And how do we stay uh, effective, consistent with our statutory mission that the governor, the Senate, and the Assembly all want us to do? And, and I think the answer to that, colleagues, is that we just keep doing what we're doing. We keep holding these public hearings where we are taking in public comment and trying to be transparent and giving stakeholders of all types the ability to speak to the department and, and to speak out loud in venues that otherwise do not appear to exist. And that we just keep plugging along with our reports and we try to do the solid, you know, best job that we can on that. And it's really up to others, the legislature, the ones that write the laws to figure out, you know, how they do that. I also think it might be worthwhile for us eventually soon to go before the legislature and talk to them about what we're seeing and what we're recommending. Uh, that that venue is a place that folks will be forced to listen to us um, and to make all of our extremely hard work here um, um, uh, uh, you know, relevant. Um, so I think we just need to keep our nose to the grindstone. Um, even though I do really have these serious concerns about how serious the department is taking us and, and, and resources and the, uh, involved. The third thing I, I do want to uh, observe, and then I'll have one more comment, is that you know, we've heard, oh, the, the department is, is, is spoon feeding you guys information. The department is, is, is determining what you put in your reports. And I'm telling the folks that say that, that it is exactly the opposite. <laughs> I'm not even getting return phone calls back. So that is not true, that the department is controlling what we do. The facts do not bear that allegation out. The fourth thing is, and I think this is something that we have to think about as a panel, is you know, either the director is, is not taking what we're doing that seriously, doesn't really care, or there is simply so much going on at the department that, that she doesn't have time in the day to, to do the kind of you know, response and to assist us in the way that's necessary. And in either case, it's a concern. Now, obviously the director's extremely busy. If she can't get back to me personally, fine. But there's a thousand other people in the department and surely one of her deputies could make these kinds of back and forth discussions. So uh, I think we have to have a discussion panel. You know, eventually we have our work plan and it's more really focused on substance. But maybe we need to put in our work plan some discussion about the structure of this agency. Structure. Of this agency. Maybe there is simply too much going on. You've got enforcement, permitting, the site mitigation, the green chemistry. You, you know, maybe there is just too many people, too much going on, and as a result, the attention to all these items, including our panel, which is one of the many, many things, it's just simply too much for one director and too much for the department to handle. So I think that there are some observations from what we're seeing, and I think one of those is that we, and I'll bring this up later today, have to consider the structure of this agency and that our recommendations uh, certainly can include ways to make their programs better. And if one of those is that this department has too much going on, that the structure needs a serious change, then I think that we should make the time in our work plan to make those recommendations. Very committed to work with the director. We're all volunteers up here. We all have busy lives. We're making time for this. And I'm gonna continue to reach out to the director and all of her staff. We want DTSC's feedback. We're gonna learn from it. Uh, it's important and we wanna help this agency, but it really is a two-way street. Uh, and so we're still very committed to, um, to drive on that street and keep chugging along and sticking with our nose to the grindstone. But I 
would be remiss, and I don't have the chance to talk to the panelists in between the meetings, but I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you what I'm thinking and what I'm seeing and hearing about the relationship between the department and our, our panel. So this is the time for the chair to make this report. I appreciate you bearing with me on this um, and wanted to make those comments. I don't know if you have any response or if we wanna move on now to the staff report. I would like to make a response to that. Um, I've noticed in the past couple of meetings that there has been a heavy backlash uh, with general public comment regarding uh, the IRP kind of being a puppet for DTSC. And I see part of director Lee's dissociation with us <coughs> as maybe a little bit of a uh, determination to dissociate herself so that it the public, the general public that makes comments to us that you guys are in the DTSC, you're working for the DTSC, you're not really an oversight um, uh, uh, committee. Maybe Director Lee is trying to dissociate herself so that it, it, those comments would not be made anymore because I feel a little bit that, uh, I felt a little bit surprised that those comments were coming to us at such a high rate. I mean, the entire time we had like an hour or two of comments of how we are basically just a puppet and DTSC controls us and basically tells us what to put in our reports. And I feel a little bit that maybe Director Lee does not want to respond to us anymore so that that would not be viewed as a problem with us doing our job. So that's another thing. Maybe she is very busy and maybe uh, she just basically doesn't have the time, but part of it may also be because she's concerned with the comments that she's been hearing made by the general public that we are somehow intimately connected to DTSC and we're basically a mouthpiece for the DTSC. Just an observation. Thank you. Mr. Vice Chair, Mr. Yeah. Vice Chair, uh, a, a bit more. I'll be a bit more elaborate. Uh, uh, local government's a lot like state government. You know, you you work for elected officials, and everybody in your jurisdiction is is, is a stakeholder, has a voice, and you have to listen to them. And and, and the director of uh, DTSC has the entire state of California. It was difficult enough to keep up with San Diego County, where we, I thought we were, both the environmental advocacy groups and the industry advocacy groups were very well organized and, 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 and spoke with one voice, and which made the job a lot easier. But some, some specific issues, as far as personnel issues. I too have, of course, and, and I, I, the, the emails, I, I receive what I consider friends, per, people I've worked with for uh, decades or maybe a short time, but very intensively on, on projects. And, and most of what I'm getting or what I consider good good ideas or important ideas is when to introduce them into the, 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 the our, our proceedings and, 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 and see how they fit and how they, they, they get along. But. Uh, State and local employees, regarding my civil service rules, uh, uh, federal laws of employment, all it's a whole separate body of law, uh, and we're. I, I think we need to stay a long way away from anything that a long stick between anything that could be associated as a personnel issue. Because what do we do with it? Uh, we don't have, we don't, we need another lawyer to advise us on personnel issues and probably a personnel officer to support the panel. I mean, I, I don't, I, I think uh, we've already got a very big mission and, and, and we stick to that and, and improve the tools and improve the, and, and therefore it'll take care of a lot of, of these underlying issues, which are, influenced by lack of the appropriate tools, continual change. We've been to too many directors, not enough, and they've reorganized too many times too, I think, Gideon. Is it what, the, you know, the structure, well, let's reorganize the, the structure of, of DTSC. I mean, at one time they were reorganizing before they finished the last reorganization. And so that, that's very frustrating to employees. So I, I really, I personally think the panel should uh, to do that. To go to more what Dr. Campbell and you both said, it became pretty clear to me uh, that perhaps by, due to public comment, due to this about us not being independent, that. 
at some level, and it might have been DTSC's counsel, I don't know, said, let's draw, no, let's build a wall between us and the independent review panel to minimize the only contact is going to be through our staff with Chris, who is in, in the building, I believe, uh, Chris Law. Uh, and, yeah, oh, right there, yeah. So I, I think that is very apparent to me. It's not stated, maybe, uh, uh, maybe for any number of reasons, but that's, you know, to me, I said, okay, that's what's happened, and that's what we're going to have to deal with. Now, the flip side of that is, is I like the the more informal approach that you're suggesting, so we can refine and get better recommendations. One that fits, one where we use the right language. Uh, but uh, I'm I'm not sure that we're going to break down that uh, thing. Uh, the I think a key part of our job. And, and go forward to make something sur survive to do it. We to take a lot of testimony and make it, we're concentrating more on record, but it's metrics. Get good sets of metrics and say, okay, this is this is a progress they're making. And I think that's really what the purpose of our 90-day report, if I remember the subsection. And so if we can get that nailed down with good metrics, that'll go a long way. It'll, it'll be something that everybody could look at. And again, uh, as I said, uh, Earlier, and I was kind of proud of myself that, uh, but, but the association metrics that, that Joy Williams in the county of San Diego and Jane Williams in the county of LA, and that uh, in, everybody can understand, including the department, the legislature. So that, that's hard to do. That's very hard to do. But I, I really think uh, we, we need to keep our eye on that. Uh, uh, the corrective action issue. Closure and post-closure are closely associated with permitting. Corrective action is almost more of an enforcement action. Well, it's not almost. It's typically done by an administrative enforcement action, and it's just almost a separate category. And, and I can see, uh, I can understand why we're we're getting a little. We're not getting clear answers on that because it's it's it's. It's not necessarily all that clear uh, when when it when you've got evidence that corrective actions required when you enter into it, basically you know administrative enforcement order where you got to have to have due process and et cetera it gets a, a little bit more complicated but uh, I, uh, we maybe need to understand that better Gideon I, I I do agree with you though I mean I think we all agree everybody in this room agrees that we we need to have the responsible parties have enough of resources to clean up their messes. So, I mean, but that's just more work. Uh, and, and finally, uh, to the director's schedule, uh, you know, from the very beginning, I said, the, the 20 years I've worked with DTSC, I've seen the responsibilities increase, uh, and in some cases, the resources decrease, and a continually shift changing of directors. And uh, so uh, I, I think that is the underlying problem for, for everything. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so that, that's the big picture problem. But uh, that, that's my comments. I hope they were responsive to yours. I, I don't think uh, we're in disagreement. We're just a little different perspectives, which is why we have a different roles on, on this panel. So, but uh, I, I, no, I really appreciate the job you're doing and you're bringing that up today. I, I think it's very important and thank you for doing that. I agree and I just wanted to make a quick point that I think it's very important for everyone, all the stakeholders to communicate. I feel there is a little bit of a lack of communication and uh, I hope that everyone who is a stakeholder recognizes that uh, we all want the same thing. We really do. We all want to do the right thing. But if we do not communicate effectively, if there is some hurt feelings, oh, so-and-so is not listening to me, my concerns are not being met, uh, so I'm not even going to bother anymore. There is going to be basically, uh, it, it, it would only exacerbate the problem and not really solve the problem. So let us communicate. If the director really feels that uh, the backlash from the public comments regarding our role and how we may be a mouthpiece or a puppet for DTSC is affecting his her communication with us, I hope that she would let us know uh, in our 
uh, open forums so that the public will recognize it too, rather than, oh, I'm just busy, I cannot deal with this. But I think we really need to keep the communication uh, transparent, open, and uh, really effective. It's, it's difficult in government sometimes to do what you suggest, and then, and then on our side, remind everybody there is such a thing as information overload, too. Yeah. I mean, See, in academia, we believe in critical, you know, we can criticize each other. We can say whatever is on our mind, and there should be no backlash. And so I'm just used to the academic way, and I hope that this panel can use a little bit of that uh, academic openness and transparency. Uh, the, the, uh, in the governor and office and the legislature, there's no such thing as tenure. There is something called term limits. Uh, uh, it, it's a completely different organization. <laughs> Thank you very much for your responses. Yeah, I, I think um, we're not talking about you know communication, you know, for communication's sake. We're talking about a lack of communication that hampers our ability to do our job. Yeah. And when it crosses that line, it's, it's disappointing and it's something that we need to continue to work on. So I know we're committed to continue to work on that. We want to do the best job that we can. We want to have a good partner in the department. We want to do things that are smart, um, um, but um, a lack of communication um, and interest in what we're doing can harm that, and that's the concern that I'm trying to raise. You are right. Any additional comments on this? Any public comment on this item at this time? No, Chair. So we're going to move on now to item number eight, the staff report. IRP staff will provide an update on matters within the panel's purview that have occurred since the last meeting. Well, it's been a very busy few weeks since the last meeting. It seems like we just had a, a meeting in Sacramento the other day. Um, Eric has been busy with all the behind the scenes stuff that uh, for this meeting and wrapping up the other meeting, um, uh, uh, taking care of reimbursements for the panel and also um, tracking the panel's budget where uh, th there'll, there'll be a um, discussion about that later in the meeting. Um, I've been... Uh, just trying to catch up um, with uh, for, for the minutes, for example, um, three sets of minutes, still have the, the minutes of the March meeting to do, so we'll be all caught up with, with that um, at the next meeting, work with individual panel members on the minutes, as well as finalizing the work plan and the committee procedures document, um, and also working with individual panel members on the uh, site mitigation recommendations and permitting recommendations that we're going to be, panel's going to be talking about. Um, I had the opportunity to represent the panel with, um, in the legislature last week uh, before budget subcommittee three, which is chaired by assembly member Richard Bloom from Santa Monica. Um, the, this was a, a hearing to look at the administration's uh, proposals for the department, and the, the the committee just wanted me to give a brief introdu introduction uh, to, uh, about the panel, um, kind of let them remind remind them of you know what your mission is and all of that, and um, so I, I did that. I, I, I uh, reminded them about um, SB uh, 83. I discussed the composition of the panel um, and uh, also quickly went through things that the panel must do, the various reports that you have to, to do. Um, I uh, went into a little bit of detail on the um, January 28th report, your initial recommendations, focusing mostly on the, I think, seven or eight recommendations that require statute. Um, I mentioned all of them. Um, emphasized the, um, the, the, your, the panel's support for uh, the department's budget request, um, and especially the, um, um, the uh, uh, funding for th making those eight temporary permitting positions uh, permanent positions, which was the next item to be discussed. Um, by the panel right after me. Actually, I was I was sandwiched between Barbara Lee. Barbara Lee spoke for the department before me on um, uh, on really on the the Exide cleanup, and then also spoke after me on those uh, eight permitting um, 
positions. Um, also talked about the, your work plan, um, uh, outlined it very, very briefly, and um, you know, let them know that you're all working hard. And that is the staff report. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, uh, uh, Rolfus. Any comments? Just thanks again for the great job both you and Eric are doing. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Ditto. Yes, thank you. Okay, colleagues, uh, just a time check. It's uh, quarter to 11. Um, we are, as usual, running a little bit behind schedule. But we do have a uh, full um, remainder of the day. Um, yeah, why don't we take a uh, five, 10 minute break, um, reconvene close to 11 o'clock, and then we'll go through the rest of the agenda. Make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. We'll adjourn for five or 10 minutes.
I'd like to call back to order the April 7, 2016 meeting of the uh, Independent Review Panel, Department of Toxic Substances Control. I almost said the meeting of the Kern County Board of Supervisors. <laughs> Um, okay, colleagues, uh, we are now on, um, we, we determined we would move agenda item 10, uh, which will be a shorter item before item nine, so we're now on item 10. Discussion and possible action on organizational, operational, and administrative guidelines of the IRP, including meeting procedures, work plan, and budget review. There are uh, you know, five little things I wanted to identify um, and uh, talk through a little bit with the panel members. We do also have public comment on this item from Ms. Brostrom. If you don't mind panel members, let's take the public comment first and then I'll get to my points and if anyone else has any other items uh, to discuss on under this um, agenda matter, we can do that. Ms. Brostrom? So do you, are you saying you want to, um, after we raise our issues, maybe you want to talk? Uh, yes. Okay. So uh, these are just some topics I wanted to discuss, colleagues, um, on this item. The first is uh, we have finalized our work plan and our administrative uh, you know, guidance document. Those are now uh, on the website. Uh, we've created a new uh, tab on the website. It's entitled, uh, um, IRP governance documents. And so that's where both of those documents are, the work plan as well as the um, uh, panel procedures document. Uh, is there any objection, panel members, to also putting in there the IRP statute? Okay, so you can do that, uh, Mr. Areca. Uh, the next item um, is, um, um, you know, the translation, uh, colleagues. If you recall at our last meeting, we determined that you know, we may not be able to have translation at every meeting. It's quite expensive. We have a limited budget. And um, I can't remember the last meeting where somebody used the translation services. Perhaps they're gonna be used this afternoon, maybe. Um, 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 but um, just want to identify in general, I think what we're gonna have to do is sort of on an ad hoc basis, depending on what's going on in the agenda, you know, make that determination whether we want it. We did do it for this meeting because we thought we're gonna be here with a, a lot of Spanish speakers, uh, but in general, um, it's about $1,500 or $2,000 just to translate. Um, and if you add that up over the course of the year, uh, it's probably gonna be something like, you know, $20,000 just for translation and our whole budget is $50,000. Um, so uh, just wanted to identify uh, you know, that um, sort of be an ad hoc decision, I guess, based on staff's view of what we might need and then the chair can, can have input on that. Um, is there any thoughts on that? Or I think we've talked that through already. Do we know how long it takes, what kind of lead time we need to arrange for a translator? We really need to um, uh, hire the translator sh shortly after getting out the <clears throat> meeting agenda. And of course the meeting agenda goes out 10 days before, or maybe a little earlier than that. But uh, we've learned that we can't, um, hire a, a translator as a last minute decision from, the, you know, from the others at DTSC. So, um, it really, it really needs to, we really need to decide at the time that we send out the agenda or very shortly thereafter. Would there be a way perhaps, and I, I, I'm not sure this would be that effective, but to incorporate it in the work plan. In other words, if you anticipate you want to talk on some subject and speak on some subject and your first language is Spanish to uh, let us know a month in advance or something, you know, uh, I, it would be, uh, it might help a, a few people. I, 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 I'm not, I don't know if it's worth the effort to be honest, but. Yeah. Uh, it has been five months pretty much, where we have had meetings uh, and not a single uh, episode has occurred where we needed the help of a translator. So just from our history thus far, it doesn't seem to be a necessity. Right. Just 
I think we're all on the same page. We, I think there might be certain meetings where it is needed. We'll see if it gets used today, for example. But in general, we're probably not gonna be having translation services unless there's some reason why we think the agenda for a particular meeting is, is gonna necessitate that. Also, it might be the case where um, I'm, I'm sure this is, or I'm hopeful this is not gonna be the last meeting where we sort of take the show on the road, and maybe for some of those meetings, particularly in populations where there are a lot of Spanish speakers, you know, we may consider it, you know, for those, but okay. So that's the translation issue. Uh, the next one is, is just a couple other things that I've been thinking about um, that I, again, it's hard for us to talk about these things in between the meetings. Um, where do we stand, colleagues, on this issue of, of visiting the branch offices of DTSC? Or, or trying to work with the department or giving some direction to our staff on the ability to, um, to go visit some of these branch offices. And maybe Ms. Barnes, you can uh, chime in on this too. I'm not suggesting that we have three panelists go. I, I, that would be a Bagley Keen and a whole thing. Um, but probably, you know, certain panelists, one could go to the, the branch offices to, to you know, have a discussion and, and listen perhaps to DTSC staff to help empower the staff, to let them know that we're listening. Other than that, you know, there's got to be a way to reach out to DTSC staff to some extent, whether it's through a survey or other you know, way that we can reach out to them. But I am concerned that if we go for two years and the only thing that we get is interaction with Mr. Law and the upper management of the department, that we're not really making ourselves available to you know, all thousand people and hearing from them. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what the answer is to this, but I wanted to at least raise it again and get a sense as to what the sense of the panel is. Maybe we can have a compromise of having a luncheon meeting with some of the staff who want to come and communicate with us and we can have maybe a visit to some of the uh, branch offices, uh, but do so as an informal kind of a lunch meet your IRP member representative and just come and have an informal discussion of your concerns and we as, uh, you know, just as stakeholders, we as members of the IRP need to hear you, so gonna have a very informal lunch meeting where it's going to be not during the time where they're working and it wouldn't be a problem uh, that Director Lee was stating that it might interrupt their work day and that gives them the opportunity to come and talk to us if and we can be responsive to their concerns as stakeholders. What do you think about that? Uh, 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 Ms. Barnes, do you have any thoughts? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. There's um, no legal impediment to an individual panel member visiting a DTSC office um, as long, I mean, you all have been very, um, at least from my observation, very careful about observing Bagley Keene and uh, both in its spirit and in the letter of the law. So if an individual panel member wishes to visit a DTSC office, there is no legal impediment to that whatsoever. The logistics I will leave to folks better than, <laughs> leave the logistics to other folks who are better at that than I, but in terms of legality, there's no legal impediment at all. And uh, but we, we want the, the visit to be you know, meaningful, so if there's certain ideas or concerns or um, um, uh, strengths that are, di that are discussed of the department at those meetings, we could have a time in an agendized meeting for the panelists to report on what they're hearing, correct? Uh, uh, absolutely. I think that the panel has expressed <clears throat> even today, that balancing act you need to do between gathering information but maintaining a certain high level oversight or overview of the department uh, consistent with your uh, statutory charge. I think all of you have commented you're not here to get involved in, to, in individual personnel actions, uh, et cetera, as valid they, as they may be. Um, but yours to look at it from a higher overview level, but to do that, you also need to do information gathering. So again, I think you could <clears throat> either today or at a subsequent meeting work out some of the, the thoughts that you might want to uh, gather information on from a local DTSC office personnel, and then one of you could go to an office in maybe different parts of the state, and then bring that information back to discuss here at one of your meetings uh, in open session. Vice Chair, do you have any thoughts on this question? 
Uh, <coughs> Yeah, I, again, depending on what's brought up, I, I, if we want to do it and get a broader base, I say a survey, keep in mind uh, men, many of DTSC's workers are field workers. You go to the office and they're not going to be there. You know, uh, uh, they're gonna, you, you'll get the administrative and the support types and maybe the supervisors, or you'll get people that have uh, particular concerns uh, that may or may not, would, that might very much be a, a one in a thousand opinion you're gonna get and, you're, and we're gonna extrapolate and say that's what the department thinks. And I don't think you, there's any way that we can visit and get a, uh, a really a representative sample. Uh, I mean, I've been to most of the, you know, I've never been to the Berkeley office. Uh, uh, you know, I go to happy hour with, I mean, you know, the, I go to conferences with DTSC employees. I mean, uh, and, and uh, so, so I've got an advantage you two don't have is the only reason I'm pointing that out. And I, I, I'm not sure, uh, my biggest concern is you get some, you get something and you feel obligated to do something with that information from that meeting that day. And it might be, a, like I say, a one in a thousand, and then we're gonna take this and extrapolate to where we're, Senator Dave Allen said, keep the big picture. And uh, and, and on the, the items, the, the statute. So the, that's my primary concern. If we're gonna do anything along these lines, I think a survey would more likely be representative, be uh, more likely uh, to coincide with the director's desire that we don't disrupt the work day. Uh, and, and again, uh, the, the people I think we really want to talk to, uh, I hope are out in the field uh, most of the time when we show up. I like the idea of a survey. That might be the best way to do it because it can be a, um, non-identifying survey so that people can be more honest without worrying about the consequences. But if we do a survey and then have our staff perhaps look at all the results of the survey and see if this is indeed a minor issue or a major issue, that might work. On the other hand, if independently we go and do site visits and we get the feedback, and of course, you know, there are going to be probably those cases where it's going to be very unique cases. Uh, that's somewhat subjective. But if we go independently to different sites and then we come here and we see that there is a commonality in the concerns that we're getting, then we'll know that it may be uh, not just a one in a thousand case, but it may be something that is a general concern that needs to be addressed. And how will that fit in within the, the statutory responsibilities of the panel? Well, I guess it depends what the topic is. I mean, uh, you know, if we're hearing people saying that there's a backlog in permitting in this particular, uh, you know, bottleneck, and we hear that from 10 people, that's one thing. If you're hearing about other things that we have no input over, that's another. Um, so it sounds to me just the sense of the panel is that we do want to have some interaction with staff. Um, we're not sure exactly the best way to do it. Would it be appropriate to direct our staff to communicate with Mr. Law and whoever else at the department to try to figure out how the, the panel in a organized, meaningful, and um, not overly intrusive way uh, can interact directly with the DTSC staff, whether it's through a visit, whether it's through some sort of e-survey, um, and then maybe they can report back to us at the next meeting and then we can figure out what next steps might be. Is that an okay approach? That's an approach, another one that popped in my mind, but again, we might not have the right personal protective equipment or training, be go with it and, and as scientists on an inspection and really learn some more about, it. get the both of the interface with the regular, uh, uh, I think that, well, it's very valuable to me to have that experience. And I used to go out with DTSC and US EPA inspectors just to see how we differed and, and do that. I thought that was valuable, but uh, just another thought. Uh, you know, you know, my sense, that is valuable. I, I think that is probably valuable. Yeah. Um, but it, I think getting, looking, focusing at the, on, and I think that even from that sort of micro inspection, there could be some of these larger lessons that are to be learned. But I think also what I'm aiming for here is to sort of get a sense on some of the big picture issues overall, you know, what we're seeing, and to make the staff feel like we care about them, that we understand that part of our mission 
statutorily um, is to make sure that the, we listen to staff at the department and that we are taking into account what the staff is saying. And I'm concerned that if we have, do not have that interaction with the staff, that all we talk about and all we do is meet with the DTSC management in rooms like this, that we are not fulfilling our statutory mission. So that's where this concern is coming from. I think there's lots of different ways to address it. But in general, are we okay with this approach of our staff? You've listened to our concerns today. Think about it, talk with Mr. Law and the other DTSC staff and see if there's some kind of a mutually agreeable proposal that we can perhaps discuss at the next meeting? Um, I would like to just um, also talk a little bit more about the anonymous survey. I think that's a really good approach, maybe a f primary approach where it's going to be a little bit of work to put the survey together, uh, but I think at least we'll get and an idea. And to tabulate it if you get a lot of responses, but yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, but at least I think that it'll give us a primary kind of a vision of what's happening to across the board with DTSC staff. And I think it has to be a short survey, but very, very clear and concise uh, points in the survey. And um, I would like to nominate my uh, I'm sorry to say, our Vice Chair Vizier, because he has more experience probably in the field to maybe put something together that would kind of encompass some of the issues that you think would be I, I think we, we, we want to probably limit it to metrics and the uh, things we're interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, it's tough to write good survey questions. Uh, it's, uh, but I think I could work with Larry and, and Eric to, and, and I'm sure that DTSC has a survey tool that they use, <laughs> and it's to make sure that they would allow us, enable us to use that for this purpose, and I, of course I would have no objection to uh, DTSC's idea. I mean, it might be very valuable to the director too. So uh, you're getting the sense of the panel here. I'm not sure we're writing off this, the visits either, but um, why don't you think about this, communicate again, I'm reiterating, but uh, with the DTSC folks, uh, if panel member Vizier is willing to work on this with you, you work with him, and then report back to the overall panel as to where you are in a month. Does that I make sense? Any objection to that, colleagues? Oh, certainly no. Uh, certainly no objection. One thought in terms of survey. Uh, one tool I've used for other organizations is SurveyMonkey, and it's an online service that's very inexpensive, and it it can be very helpful in sending out a survey to a select group as well as getting responses in and help you correlate those responses. So that can be a tool that that could be used. Thank you, Council. Okay, the next topic uh, that I had has to do with a, a list of contacts. So um, Mr. Areca has put together a list of sort of contacts, folks that have reached out to the department. I've also provided him with a list of contacts. Uh, this includes um, uh, former members of the department, um, other folks in government that do panels like ours, other folks in government that interact with DTSC, some DTSC staff that have reached out to us, um, you know, uh, former directors of DTSC, former directors of Cal EPA, um, you know, the kind of folks that may have some ideas for our panel. Um, and what I would uh, like to discuss now um, is, you know, how should we use that contact list? I know our staff's really been playing catch up, and particularly this month, where they had sort of a, a short period of time before the April report, but our next report is not due till July, um, which is soon, but it still it gives them three months to sort of catch their breath, um, which I think is a month more than we had for a variety of reasons since Mr. Um, uh, Rolfes wasn't even hired until February. Um, would it be appropriate um, for Larry or even for Eric, um, you know, to, to sort of reach out to these people, make sure that they know that we're out here, ask them to engage with us, and perhaps ask them sort of a basic set of questions and perhaps solicit some information, um, you know, over the next three months? Um, uh, I wanted to see what you as staff thought about this and then certainly also what the panel members might think as well. I have no problem taking on that project to uh, reach out to the contact list and bring forth 
a series of questions that they can answer. Mr. Um, Rolfes, what's your thought on this? Well, I think a, a survey monkey um, survey would be perfect for that that group, and um, I, I work with Survey Monkey all the time, and would be, you know, thrilled to um, put together some, um, you know, good questions for them, and and certainly we want to build um, build a database on all these people. Is there an ability to be anonymous on the Survey Monkey if you want to be? You have to think that through too. I'm sure you know, some there folks is. may not want things attributed to them or whatever. And sometimes I think there might, you know, you may want to call one of the former, you know, the Cali PA secretary perhaps in person and talk to them. But um, um, that's what staff is saying. Colleagues, what do you think about this? I think it's a good idea. I think it's going to be important for us to see what all of our stakeholders are thinking. And Survey Monkey is the ideal way of anonymously getting some feedback. Uh, stop. I mean, particularly if we write the questions along with our responsibilities and reporting what are good metrics. I know that a lot of these people that you're talking about in this case have given that a lot of thought and uh, it might have some very good constructive I ideas for us. Okay. okay. So, um, all right, so are you getting this? Oh, sorry, uh, Mr. Rolfes? Well, the trick is is asking good questions, and um, you know, one suggestion would be to um, um, come to the next meeting with um, you know work with Mike or whoever on a, a really you know de determine at this meeting exactly what we want um, from those uh, contacts, and then um, you know we could put together a. a some survey questions and the panel could discuss them at the next meeting and then we get it out, the, you know, the day after. It sounds, that sounds good. Uh, I mean, I think what I'm thinking about is, um, you know, the panel is supposed to be drafting recommendations in these four areas and in general about improving their, um, the DTSC's uh, uh, performance. So what do these people think about those different areas and what mm -hmm. recommendations would they make uh, or metrics or whatever it might be? That's certainly one of the things that I'm looking for. Um, uh, Vice Chair, are you willing to take this on too? Yeah, they're pretty closely related. I mean, I, I, yeah, I think at every level, it doesn't matter if you're a past secretary of Cal EPA or a, uh, a, a, a new scientist to DTSC. There'll be different perspectives, but the, the, the information we want to gather is pretty much along the same subject lines. Okay, so you'll work with our staff on that. And in the meantime, um, uh, Mr. Rekha, you know, why don't you work on that database a little bit, you know, try to get those people's emails. If you have questions of me or whatever, uh, we can work on that. But let's try to set ourselves up so that um, after our next meeting, we'll be ready to roll on this and won't still have to do a lot of research. Um, so we want to, if there are co colleagues, if you want to add names to those lists, give it to Mr. Areca, um and then Mr. Rekha, if you don't mind. And if it becomes too burdensome and you're spending hours and hours on this, you know, then let's talk about it. But if you can, you know, generally try to find, track these people down um, so that when we are ready, we, we can get to them quickly. If you don't mind spending some time on that in April, that'd be great. Yes, Chair. Okay. The next um, topic I have um, uh, is um, one for us internally. Uh, do we have an obligation from our own HR perspective uh, to evaluate our staff? You know, we, we did not put that in there in our work plan, but I do think at some point in time, it's for the benefit of our staff and for the benefit of us to go through uh, not an overly cumbersome or crazy evaluation process, but I do think that we, as the people that oversee our staff, should have an obligation um, to um, evaluate their performance. I think, like you know, most other agencies and departments do, so I wanted to raise that question because I don't think we covered it in the work plan. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I haven't given that a lot of thought, but obviously we should at least have some kind of input into the process Yeah, at a minimum. So, uh, Dr. Campbell? Um, yeah, I think that's important, uh, but uh, I don't know if there is something in place by DTSC where they use to evaluate their staff and if we can maybe use that in parallel 
uh, to evaluate our staff as well. I think it would be uh, kind of a helpful tool. Well, I think the way it's set up is the director, assistant director, is going to be doing the evaluation on, on, on them, and that we, I think they would greatly appreciate our input. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure exactly what the process is. We need is. to, um, yeah. yeah. There, I don't think there is a process in place. Ms. Barnes, do you have any thoughts on this? Generally speaking, uh, throughout the state system, if there is a civil service employee, there's usually a set protocol by which you have certain evaluations during your probationary period, and then once you pass that period, there's evaluations throughout your career at different intervals. Um, that's something I'm happy to look into and see what the structure is for um, the IRP staff and see how we can coordinate that with input from the uh, panel. So could you please report on that at the next meeting? Absolutely. Thank you. Any objection to that, colleagues? All right, so the next question I have, and this is the final one that I had at least on this topic um, or this agenda item, you know, is, um, you know, uh, do, <laughs> this question about structural reforms at DTSC. Uh, you'll hear folks say that DTSC needs a governing board. You'll hear folks say that uh, the green chemistry program should go over to OEHA. You'll hear folks say that site mitigation somehow should be split off from the department in its own agency or somehow given to the water boards. Uh, there might be other questions that, um, that folks, or ideas that folks have. Not so much on the, the merits, I'm sorry, not so much on the substance of our four main topics um, that are identified uh, in the statute 57014. Uh, permitting, enforcement, public outreach, and fiscal management, uh, but maybe it would be more sort of structural in nature on uh, 57014D, you know, making recommendations for improving the department's programs. Uh, and um, I'm hearing from my appointing authority that they want to make sure that we're keeping those things in mind. So the question that I have for the panel members is, do we feel that our current work plan uh, where we're sort of divided ourselves among these topics, adding in site mitigation and um, uh, source reduction, do we feel that there is a, a, a place um, uh, for us to make those recommendations uh, in our existing work plan, that's, and whether that's necessary even? So that's a, a question I wanted to raise. Um, personally, I think that is a really big Issue. I don't know if we could even tackle it in a small, short two to three month uh, uh, time space. But personally, I feel that if we are to even consider it and discuss it and think about it, it needs to be something that is done at the end of all of our informative uh, meetings. Because I feel presently, for example, I really don't think we have enough of the necessary information to be able to even tackle that issue. I think that if we are to tackle that issue at any point in our meetings, it would be towards the end of our mission, towards the end of that two-year time point. Um, I would like to hear your I'm opinions on up. that. I'm just pulling up our work plan now, and I think there is sort of an overall sort of concluding Just report call. in there. Oh, do you have it? So we have in the April, July time period for next year, you know, other potential topics. Um, and then we do have a final recommendation report, which would come at the end of next year. So do you think that might be an appropriate place to tackle some of these things? Yes. Do you have any thoughts, Vice Chair? Well, Maureen Gorsham reorganized and left before the reorganization was finished. Green chemistry came about. They didn't add any people. They moved a bunch of people to green chemistry. Uh, the vocal agency, you know, the, the people we'd go to for technical answers were now wiped out, almost non-existent. So that was another core function that wasn't being performed. Uh, Debbie Raphael came in, fixing the foundation, uh, looking at that. A lot of 
what resulted from that effort is just now being put into place. I mean, literally, you know, and you need to have, I think, an organ, if you, at least a couple of years to, to make sure the new structure makes, that, that we've already made. Uh, you know, uh, uh, suggestions on keeping people or adding people uh, already. We, we made structural recommendations already. When it came to, to us, I, I don't, uh, I, I think anything that's uh, very obvious from our discussions, from all the stakeholders, uh, that, that uh, this either needs maybe not so much reorganization, but additional resources, uh, uh, then I, I think we should bring that up appropriately with any one of the, uh, the, the issue areas. Uh, perhaps at the end we might see something glaring, but that, that overall reorganization I think should be uh, somewhat infrequent, uh, but, but yet, you know, and I think DTSC does. I mean, I, I can't remember the name of the unit, but I think everybody's working on Exide right now. Uh, uh, and, and then what may, once that's uh, under control and moving in the right fashion, some of those people will be moved to other projects. And, and so that kind of flexibility is a good thing, but it's also temporal. I mean, you know, uh, uh, five years from now, uh, yeah, we wouldn't. Have, you need to put this many people in excess. I think what I'm trying to say is we have to be very careful uh, about the overall organization structure. But I, at the same time, I think that we've already come upon some obvious areas w where they need additional resources for additional time. And so uh, that's a very wishy-washy answer. To, to, I, I think we're already doing that. I, I guess is what I'm trying to say, and doing it fairly well. I think. <laughs> Yeah, I, um, I do think that um, all these points are, are well taken. You know, we do have this final recommendations report. So after we're going to be at this for two years, gosh willing, um, you know, monitoring the metrics, monitoring the compliance, seeing what's going on, um, it would seem to me that if we think the structure is fundamentally flawed, that we're not seeing the improvements that we're making, that we're gonna be obligated to, to recommend that. But it seems that we do have not only the opportunity along the way to make some recommendations, but that we also do have, at the end, the ability to do that. So I'm satisfied with that. Yeah, and I think what I understood about your point about the structural changes is some of these uh, issues regarding whether or not there needs to be uh, a division where DTSC is working on permitting and enforcement and that's their only duty and the other things that they're doing may need to be shifted to other entities maybe because that was what I understood from the point that you were making that perhaps DTSC is trying to do too many things and with the resources it's giving it's not capable it's just um, not focused on one area and so this kind of dilution of various areas is making it difficult for it to do a good job on all of the things that it's trying to do, on but, all of its goals but, and missions. But, but keep in mind, most of why they're doing too many things is because the, the law statute requires them to do it. <laughs> they were assigned that job. Yeah, and I think you know, there's, there's a, we, we heard yesterday um, on the Kettleman tour from, um, from uh, Chem Waste, you know, for example, the permitting process uh, and the permitting appeals process and the Tanner Act process. Um, that there's, you know, like, you know, dangling participles of things that don't even exist anymore that are still in the code, and it's just such a deep, you know, the, the code is so detailed with so much in it that a lot of folks don't even know what's in it anymore, but I think these are some of the structural things that we can talk about. Say, listen, you gotta simplify this, update it, you know, to the 21st century, and be realistic about what this department can and can't accomplish. But I, I guess the sense, we're hearing from the panel members is that we do have the ability to do that. And I do think that some of those really big discussions could occur after we feel comfortable that we know what we're talking about at the end of 2017. Yes. Just to clarify, I, and you just shifted my whole uh, understanding of uh, from the actual operational, the org chart of DTSC to the organization of the uh, California Hazardous Waste Control Law. Uh, which is 
to me exciting actually that there, there's a lot of things that could be fixed there and updated uh, or just plain to, deleted uh, but yeah that but that's that's kind of a separate issue outside of our well, I mean, it, it is and it isn't because you were just, I think, correctly indicating that the DTSC keeps getting these things added on, doesn't have the staff to do it, and it's tough to prioritize in that situation. So maybe a statute that's clear, uh, that's updated, can help the department focus, and maybe you chop some of these things off and put them somewhere else. Uh, but it's a huge undertaking. It would take somebody locked in a room, you know, years to rewrite all of this in a meaningful way. Uh, but I, I don't think that's necessarily. Uh, um, out of the question, <laughs> uh, based on everything that we're seeing. Again, I, I, I want to move on, and I think the sense is, is that we can talk about these things later, that we will have the space, if necessary, to talk about them, um, um, and I'm, I'm satisfied with that at this point in time. Yeah, and you know, the, the new uh, s committee consultant for environmental safety and toxic materials would have some really good ideas there. <laughs> Right. I'm not sure he'd want to be the one locked in the room for two years uh, writing this, but uh, it's possible. We have any public comment? Ms. Brostrom, are you in the room on this? Okay, so those were all the, those were all the topics that I wanted to cover. Is there anything more before we take public comment on this item number uh, 10? Ms. Williams, did you want to say something? Yes. And we're talking about permitting, right? No. No. Not at this time. We're not talking about permitting. That's the next item. Okay. This is the general, this is item number nine, uh, the um, general, um, so pardon me, this is item 10, the, uh, or, the organizational, operational, and administrative matters. Did you have a comment on that? Yes. You can begin. Since you're talking, this, again, Jane Williams, California Communities Against Toxics. Since you're talking about looking into the actual sort of regulatory underpinnings and state law that are driving the agency forward, one of the interesting provisions of RICRA is that a lot of the stuff that's supposed to be in RICRA is actually out because of federal exemptions. And our state has only adopted a few of the federal exemptions, but the ones that it has adopted are very substantive. And um, Mike Vizier can understand this. One of the first ones is what's called CE squeegee, the conditionally exempt small quantity generators. So we adopted that federal exemption and um, actually, Mr. Vizier would know better than I what, what those actual requirements are, but the bottom line is that we end up with a tremendous amount of hazardous waste in our municipal waste stream. And then it creates problems in its management and uh, in its disposal. And um, I've actually been working on this issue at the federal level and contemplating whether or not we should be asking the federal EPA to revisit this. The second is we have basically the metal shredder exemption. And there are certain areas in California, if you look, that metal shredders, because they're exempt from RCRA, and they're really essentially, in some areas of the state, virtually unregulated, are creating essentially RCRA corrective action problems, both with stormwater and with disposal and with hazardous emissions. Um, and Mr. Krakoff, you would understand with Pacoima, where we have just massive concentration of metal shredders, um, tremendous amount of, sub of substantial environmental damage in environmental justice communities. So, um, if you're going to look at the underpinnings of the hazardous waste control laws, you really have to start with what's in and what's out of the system. And what is the environmental damage being done from things being in and out of the system? So when Director Raphael announced at the same time that she permitted the Kettleman Hills facility that the state would embark on this big effort to reduce the amount of hazardous waste that the state created, well, that was really the wrong paradigm because we really need to increase the amount of hazardous waste that the state has created. And then we need to find a different way to manage it. 
because again, a lot of the environmental damage that's occurring is occurring for things from things that are out of the system, not in the system. So um, that, this is a whole other topic of conversation, but I just wanted to point that out to you. And one of the significant problems that the department has is that it has lost its ability to do technology assessment. So for instance, you know, a lot of the material that's going to, to the hazardous waste landfills, to, to Kettleman and the other hazardous waste landfills, contaminated soils. Um, I went and visited the first soil washing facility that was sited in the state, actually in San Diego, almost two decades ago, okay? And our state does not use soil washing. It's being used right now at the Bayview Hunters Point facility where they're, they're using soil washing and they're washing the soil. But I mean, we could cut down significantly on the amounts of hazardous waste that we produce um, if we would engage in a comprehensive implementation of soil washing. So, um, and the department just doesn't, you know, it doesn't have a mechanism to look at the application of what is now a 20 year old technology. It's not anything that's advanced or new or fancy or anything like that. So uh, just to, to kind of point those, I know that the IRP is trying to look at things um, from a programmatic way, but if you're actually gonna kind of open this up and start thinking about what, what is the construction of our hazardous waste control laws, how has a department failed to implement and um, embrace different technologies, in, both in its site remediation program and in its hazardous waste, um, the generator side of things, right? That would be a very, very fruitful discussion, I believe, at this particular point in time, and I would encourage the IRP to do that, possibly in a separate special hearing. Thank you. Mr. Rolfe, is you feeling overwhelmed yet? Okay. I am. Yes. This is Claudia Spanish translation. Rosa and Ias Barça, Clean Water Fund. Um, I'd really like you to consider, uh, as you move south, the increase in necessity to have the Spanish language translations. I think when you are here later this afternoon, you will see that many of our residents in the fence line communities are primarily uh, Spanish speakers. There's also some indigenous languages that are spoken. So, and as you go closer to Los Angeles, you will have another diverse population of people. Depending on what time your meetings are held, it's pretty much who will be available. So even though you've been in the northern areas and haven't had to use Spanish language translation, I think you will find this afternoon that it would be pretty advantageous for you to have that. Thank you. That's why we do have, we do have a translators today. Okay, um, anything further on this topic, colleagues? Okay, hearing none, we will move on. Okay, so a time check. It's 11.43. I'm sorry. Oh, yes, sir. Mr. Chair, uh, uh, Eric pre prepared a budget re document. Are we gonna cover that in this section or? Yeah, is this the time to cover that, Eric? This would be the time, yes. Yes, thank you very much. Sorry I missed that. <clears throat> Please. It will take me a minute to get it set up, so. And, and now you'll see why we're considering eliminating uh, translators. <laughs> yeah. That's thank you for bringing that up, though. That's what keyed my.
probably ready, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, this is, as the title says, Independent Review Panel Preliminary Budget Report. Um, I say preliminary because a lot of these numbers are based off of averages and uh, numbers that we don't really have concrete yet. Um, to start off, the total budget for the IRP uh, travel and general expenses are pulled from a lump sum of $50,000, as we all know, and that's as per SB 83, uh, 57014. Section G stating the total amount of money expended for panel expenses pursuant to this paragraph shall not exceed $50,000 per year. Uh, some of these breakdowns of expenses, uh, one of the major ones is travel breakdown, uh, which covers airfare, uh, which is under Concur Solutions under the DTSC account uh, for booking, uh, lodging, which is where we stay every time that we go somewhere, uh, mileage, uh, more so personal vehicles, uh, food, which covers breakfast, lunch, and dinner consumed during business, and per diem, state allowance, which is $100 a day. And parking, as we all know, that can be pretty bad. Uh, the general expenses breakdown is uh, broken down into venue, uh, when we are not authorized, uh, at a state supported venue like this one, we do have incur costs. Um, translations of meeting agenda, uh, we do translate our agendas for the Spanish speakers. Uh, spontaneous translation during meetings, which has been a hot topic today. Um, approximate spending to date. Uh, travel claims that I've submitted through March 8th, 2016 have totaled roughly $7,364.74, which includes the per diem, the lodging, the food, the mileage, personal and corporate, and parking up to, up to March 2016. Uh, travel claims not included, uh, which is the March 9th meeting, uh, public meeting, and the present meeting today. Uh, which is where the approximations come in of a sum of roughly $5,050. Um, so that brings it to $12,404.74 approximately. That's the travel? Yes. And lodging. Yeah, it, the breakdown. Did you want me to go back so you could see no. that? Okay. Uh, approximate spending to date continued. Uh, the airfare through March 8, 2016 is $5,991.37 uh, $5 based off of trackable, uh, trackable ticket sales on the Concur Solutions website. So those are concrete. Uh, airfare not included. Um, and I say airfare because you guys sometimes travel with uh, in your cars and stuff like that. This is based on that as well. Airfare not included, March 9th, 2016, public meeting totaling approximately $1,500 based off of average flight costs and travel costs, which approximates $6,791.37. Approximates being to date continued number three, general expenses uh, through April 5th, uh, 2016, I was able to uh, get some of the general expenses added to that one, because the other ones were from March, uh, which total 5,881 based off accounting totals that we've received from DTSC and uh, pending service authorizations for venue and translation. Uh, general expenses not included, which is the only one that's not included is this, this meeting, uh, which totals approximately 1,200 based off the average cost of our previous meetings, <clears throat> which totals $7,081. So to date, we are at $26,276.74, uh, and that's for right now, approximately. Now, our projected spending for next year, because I was asked to do that, do a projection. Um, but you just gave us some translation, yes. Now, if we were to continue the way we're spending now uh, into next year, uh, the travel would uh, total $47,990.28 based on cost averages. 
our general expenses would be $17,702.50 based on our current cost averages, which would give us a deficit of negative $15,000, 692 and 20, 78 cents. And that's it. Uh, say that again. How does the state's fiscal year fits into all this? So, how does the state's fiscal year fit into all this? So, we are currently in the uh, in one fiscal year. As of July first, we'll be in another fiscal year, right? Yes, sir. So, can you explain that to us? The reason that we're doing all right right now is because we've only been operating since November, and we will be going to June, I believe, right? Um, and that is why we are not going to go into a deficit. Um, we will go into a deficit because we will be operating at a 12 months next year, and based on averages and stuff, we will have a deficit. So even though this slide says 17, it's actually FY 1617? Yes. Okay. So theoretically, like this time next year, we'll start going into deficit? Pretty close, yes, sir. Now, uh, are we going to get regular like budget printout spreadsheets, um, you know, like a, a regular, un under regular budgeting formats with, you know, uh, uh, line items, uh, you know, the way that a budget normally looks, or we're waiting for the department to give that to us? Basically, all of our numbers are up in the air right now since we're so young. Um, when things start hitting actual printouts and we have a history, I'll be able to do an itemized breakdown for everything, um, and that will be provided by DTSE. I have talked to people about that already. Um, the reason I did this is so we could have kind of an idea of where we are. Um, I knew it wasn't going to be itemized or broken down in the detail that you wanted, but that's what we are right now. But you understand what I'm looking for, which is, you know, like a regular profit loss statement and a regular, um, I know the state does it a little bit differently, but you know, there's you know, normal budgeting spreadsheets. That's what we're asking the department for yes, when, when that's ready. Yes, sir, I do have a few of them, but in the context of this, they wouldn't make sense. There's some for some services and some for waiting, pending authorization and stuff like that. So the, the sense is, is that uh, you know, once we get that stuff and can prepare it in a professionally readable format, um, if we really feel, colleagues, that we're not going to be able to operate within the $50,000, we may need to make a recommendation to our appointing authorities identifying this issue for them. Probably not necessary today, not necessary tomorrow, uh, but potentially you know, before the end of the year, we should alert them uh, to, to these issues. Um, I very much want to thank Mr. Rekka for putting this together. I think it's very important that we as a panel keep an eye on this and that we're not oblivious to how much money we're spending. So I know our work plan has us uh, every quarter <coughs> reviewing this topic. Uh, and I want to thank you. A any other comments, colleagues? Uh, if we need to make recommendations, we need to make them before the May revise. So that's, this is April. Hmm. Uh, and uh, the only other thing I can say is we could have more meetings in Southern California and eliminate the uh, translators and, and reduce this cost some. You're saying we do have to, to make the recommendation today or tomorrow, um, it sounds like. Uh, um, or is it just sufficient for us to sort of informally contact our uh, appointing authorities and sort of let them know this, or do you think it really should be like in our report? It's an excellent question because, as Eric said, I understand you know, the government accounting. And government accounting, they're only going to look at the government accounting. <laughs> and, and that's not right because we're new. He's projecting. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, we don't even have a full fiscal year to project from that. That's out of their paradigm. You know, uh, I think 
it's probably a good question to pose to our appointing authorities to say that based on current expenses, we're projecting a, a deficit for FY 16, 17 of about a little less than less somewhere between fifteen and twenty thousand uh, dollars, based on the fifty. We can cut trans or eliminate translators, which uh, and we could probably hold more meetings in Southern California, but that probably would only reduce the deficit to five to ten thousand dollars. I'm off the top of my head. I mean, Eric could give us the numbers, but um, if I, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may make a suggestion, I think that. I would probably approach this from as many angles as you can because your $50,000 per year limitation is actually in your statute. It's not a regulation, it's not, it, it's something that I would imagine you'd want to take to your appointing authorities to have that adjusted. I also, um, and I'm not sure, maybe I'm having a, a moment, um, but uh, Mr. Vizier. You're right. I think it was the opposite, that there might be more of a need for translators as you move further south, as opposed to going further north, though I do know there's Spanish-speaking populations in Northern California as well. But I would think that that would be, and this is just a suggestion, obviously, um, is that to uh, point out that need for translators as a, an increasing budgetary concern as you operate for a full 12 months for the next fiscal year from July 1st to July 1st. So um, that those are my thoughts. Yeah, because it doesn't matter if it's in the May Resile, Revile, you can't change the budget if the statute. Well, I think you could maybe, again, I'm not a budgetary expert, thank goodness in some ways, um, but I would think you'd want to approach it from as many ways as possible, both include uh, requests for the May Revise, but also address it from a, you know, a legislative uh, approach as well. Okay, so we, we need consistent language, I think, to send our appointing authorities uh, and, and the May Revise. Uh. Um, so let's uh, talk about it when we get to item nine, please. Make sense? Okay. Anything further on this budget question? Thank you very much, Mr. Recker. I appreciate it. Yes, Chair. Anything further, colleagues, on item number 10? Okay, so just a time check. It's uh, almost uh, 12 o'clock. Uh, I would propose we take a 45 minute lunch break and reconvene at item uh, 9 promptly at 1245. Okay. Any objection to that? We're adjourned until 1245.